this is why, the, the, I mean, it's, it's funny because I think that, you know, the issue that you started to become really politically prominent on, which is the, the Bill C-16 in, in Ontario and... and in the, Canada, in, it was in federal Canada, law. In, in Canada, mm -hmm. the, the, the gender issue. Yeah. You know, that's the issue where you, now the question that's constantly being asked, so why do you even care? Why do you even mm -hmm. pay attention? And the answer is because... I was asked that, is, that earlier today. Oh, really? Like, what did you say? I'm not letting the cat have my tongue. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it has nothing to do with gender as far as I'm concerned, or that's peripheral in some sense. So the accusation, why do you care, fair enough. It's like, you know, in some way, people can go to hell in a handbasket if, it, if they're inclined to. Mm -hmm. Now, I would rather have that not happen, but in, people are, what would you say, doomed to their own autonomy. But I'm not saying words that other people want me to say. And the idea of compelled speech is like, the bill was this much about gender. Right. And it was this much, much about, right. oh yeah, the government's going to tell me what to say, hey. But now they're regulating what therapists can say, to, therapy to, sessions. This is interesting because to me, the, the problem with, with a lot of this is less a, a free speech issue, even though I'm in, on the same page with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to me, it really is a fundamental truth issue. Meaning that, yeah, you're trying to force me to say something I don't want to say. Mm -hmm. But to me, the, the, the fact that what you're trying to force me to say is so innately opposed to the good is is the problem. Like you could, you could try, I would have objections to you forcing me to say that I like a particular movie, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be true, I don't like the particular movie, it would be bad if you tried to force me to say that. Uh, but the, the level of passion that I have for, for issues like this one really go to the fact that I think the fundamental good of humanity relies on basic acknowledgements of biological truth, especially when it comes to gender. Mm -hmm. and, and, and anybody who's ever dealt with children, uh, I find myself getting, you know, I, I, if I, if I look at my own political evolution, I'd say that when I, when I grew up, I grew up in a religious home, so that means that I'm pretty conservative. And then you go to college and you're living by yourself and you're not married, you don't have kids. You tend to become a little bit more libertarian, which is like, okay, you know, let everybody do whatever they're gonna do and it's not gonna bother me. And then you have kids and you realize that there's a pool in which we are all swimming. And that pool is gonna define- Virginia, Virginia. Exactly, Virginia. exactly. Like my, my kid, it's gonna determine how my kid lives. And I want my community to reflect some of my values because I don't want my kid to live in the toxic sludge that you are that you are creating for my kid. I don't yeah, like well, you indoctrinating a, my kids in bullshit about whether yes, exactly. A, a can be people a girl, really, a girl people can be will a say, "Well, I'll exceed, but not for my children." Yeah, and that's what Virginia demonstrated. It's yeah. Like you can come after me, but you come after my kids, and that's a whole different story. It, it, it's so fundamentally opposed to everything true, and the fact that that the, and, and that's the insistence. The insistence isn't that people be treated humanely or be treated decently. The insistence is that your vision of yourself be reflected by me in defiance of baseline reality and in order to redefine how society as a whole well, works. Well, a lot of it's murky thinking. You know, if someone asked me, do I believe that there are gender fluid people? I would say, yes. And I would say, a ma man who's, a young man who's gender fluid, I, I know what he's like temperamentally. He's high in agreeableness, he's high in neuroticism, so he has a feminine temperament. He's more interested in people than things. And he's extremely high in openness. And so his temperament is fluid. Mm -hmm. He's creative, and so he's one thing one day and one thing the next. And his fundamental temperament is tilted towards the feminine. But that doesn't mean he's not a man. Right, exactly. So exactly. that's, and then, so it's murky thinking. So that's exactly right. It's, it's certainly the case that one out of 10 women, now it depends on where you put the cutoff, mm -hmm. you say, but you could say with, reasonable certainty that one in 10 women has a masculine temperament and one in 10 men has a feminine temperament. And so that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And those people, especially if they're also creative, mm -hmm. well, they're, they're kind of at a loss in relationship to what to do with their identity because they're pulled, first of all, they have a hard time catalyzing their identity. Creative people have a hard time mm -hmm. catalyzing mm -hmm. it. It's like the definition of creativity, they're protein. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are be, have been people who play at the edges of gender identity forever. And fair enough. And sometimes that's even admirable if it's done in a sophisticated way. And it's charismatic. So you see it in Mick Jagger. You see it in David Bowie. Mm -hmm. You see it, and you see it in people like Madonna as well, because Madonna had a hard edge, you know, that mm -hmm. was very masculine. And all the Marvel superhero women have a hard masculine right. edge. And so we find that charismatic because those people are also integrated. But the, the notion that there's such a thing as gender, that's not right. There's variability in personality and temperament. 
and the idea that right. that, that there's no such thing as biological sex that's that's, that's, that's just insane insanity. it's insanity they've, mm. they've they've abstracted gender from sex and then read gender back into sex yeah. is more important than sex it's completely... well and then why insist upon the biological modifications right if there's no such thing as sex, it's like, well, what? then just act out your role. Right. Leave your body alone because it's irrelevant anyways. Well, it turns out it's not irrelevant. You have to go through the surgical transformation, which is a pretty dramatic answer to a question that for 99% of people who are ambivalent about their gender identity would be best solved without surgical intervention. Yep. And then this, so now in Canada, because they banned conversion therapy, it's now all affirma affirmation therapy. Right. This is. This There's is no insane. such thing as affirmation therapy. Right. No. The, the, this. Uh, the, it's insane. I mean, the the, the 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 semantic game that was used in order to say, well, conversion therapy, which was at one time, electric, you know, using electric shock mm -hmm. to treat homosexuals, yeah. and saying that that's the same thing as you have a gender confused twelve year old. Look, I had a fourteen year old kid who was a client of mine, and. Uh, you know, he, he was in the m mid stages of puberty. He was a pretty creative kid, um, agreeable kid as well, mm -hmm. right? And that's important. So he had a bit of a feminine temperament. And that also meant he could be pushed around fairly easily. Mm -hmm. Well, there was an aggressively guy gay, in this gay guy in his school was hitting on him and trying to convince him that he was gay. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't know. So he wanted to talk to me about it. It's like, well, I wasn't going to tell him. I didn't. What the hell do I know about this kid? Exactly. You know, and I wanted to hear what his problems were and how it might be sorted out, what he wanted. And like that's that's what you do in therapy is you help people sort out their problems. Now this idea is you come to me with an axiomatic claim, whatever it is about your identity, and my job is to rubber stamp it. It's like that's not I'm not a therapist then. So this is not only insane, this insistence. Like, I like to think of truth, untruth, and anti-truth, mm -hmm. right? And the notion that therapists affirm is an anti-truth. Because, look, let's say you come to me and you say, uh, you, you have a proposition about yourself, and I say, no, I'm your therapist. No, that's wrong. It's like, that's not good therapy. But neither is you have a proposition about yourself, and you're disturbed enough to come to a therapeutic session. And I say, yes, you're right. It's like, I don't know if you're right. Mm -hmm. And if you're so right, why are you here? Like, what are we talking it's about entire, if you're already it, right? It's, it's a destruction of basically the only form of therapy that we know to work. Yes, it's Cognitive is. behavioral therapy is yeah. all about oh, saying that so, this So are the rest of them. They're all predic... This is one of the things that's interesting about clinical psychology. Every single school of psychotherapy is predicated on the idea that free expression of thought or, or the free transmutation of behavior is curative. And it's true with cognitive behavioral therapy, just like, just like psychoanalytic therapy. It's all the same thing. And also, the other axiom of therapy is voluntarily expose yourself in measured doses to what you're afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so that's an interesting thing because the psychoanalysts believed when the behaviors first came up with exposure therapy, they had it formulated wrong. They thought you learned to be afraid. So you're, you're normal, mm -hmm. and then something hurts you, and then you learn to be afraid of it. That's wrong. You're always afraid except when you learn not to. So they had it exactly mm -hmm, backwards, mm -hmm, neuropharmacologically, and it really matters, this, this, is, this, this matters. That doesn't mean you can't learn some fears, you can, but mostly you unlearn terror, mm -hmm. right? So children are afraid to get away from their mother. It's because they're afraid of the entire world. Well, you have to learn how not to be, and you don't learn that by habituation, because that was the idea. So mm -hmm. you take someone who's afraid, they've been conditioned to be afraid, you expose them to what they're afraid of, and then you have them do relaxation exercises so they counter condition. Mm -hmm. Well, then it was discovered, and they don't have to do the relaxation exercises. It's like, oh, well, it still works, just exposure. It's like, well, they get less afraid when you expose them because their fear habituates. Like, so then the psychoanalyst said, well, if they get less afraid of that particular thing, the symptoms are just going to substitute because that fear of an elevator, say, was reflective of a deeper fear, fear of death. I had a client I exposed to an elevator, the doors opened, she said, that's a tube. It's like, and, and her fantasy about the elevator was, it was a place she was going to die in, of mm -hmm. a heart attack, mm -hmm. while people were discomforted and, what would you say, made uh, contemptuous of her foolishness while she was suffering and dying. Mm -hmm. So social alienation and death, that was the elevator for her. So we expose her to the elevator. What does she learn? not to be afraid of the elevator. No, no, no. She learns she can tolerate those fears. She learns to be brave. Mm -hmm. And so the psychoanalysts were exactly, they were diametrically wrong because 
if you expose someone to anything they're, they're afraid of, effectively, they get less afraid of everything, right? And so that's partly why psychotherapy is curative in that manner, is that people discover that they're bigger than their fears. Look, they don't discover that the fears are trivial. I, I think that the cult of authenticity is going to be the destruction of all psychotherapy then. Because if the cult of authenticity is that your true authentic feelings are what makes you you, then the attempt to make you brave in spite of your fears is a suppression of your fears. It's, mm -hmm. almost like a, it's almost like a Freudian analysis of you're suppressing your sexual desire and this is not full authenticity. Yeah, right, why isn't the fear you? Right, exactly. The authentic you. Exactly, and I, and I think that mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of where we're going. It seems like the... Mm -hmm. the yeah, well, uh, so this, 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 this movement towards unity that we were talking about, this is a place I think where like informed liberals and conservatives could meet. It's like, well, there is this authenticity, let's say, and drive for adventure. And you see that elevated to the highest place in some sense in the more careless Disney movies. But the full manifestation of that in an integrated sense is the drive towards authenticity inside this higher order unity. It has to be, because otherwise it's disuniting. It causes fragmentation and chaos. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be subordinate to a higher order end. And then you might say, well, what is that? Part of that's the reciprocal, reciprocal altruism that the evolutionary biologists are always on about. It's like. Some for you, some for me. Mm -hmm. Some for you, some for me, in measure, right? And that makes both of us richer. And so that's part of the higher order unity, and people are intensely, reciprocally altruistic. That's great. It's good. Actually, if I can get a re-up on something, that would be awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. And so, um, it's authenticity in the service of what? Now, when P Pinocchio becomes real, he's already rescued his father, right? So. He's established an accord with the tradition that gave birth to him already. He's revitalized that. So when he wakes up, he's not free. He doesn't have any strings on him anymore, but he's already existing in a harmonious relationship with, with his father, which is a big deal. And one of the lovely things about what happens to me as a consequence of my lectures is that lots of fathers and sons come up to me and say, we've really worked out our relationship. It's like, and they're both like, you've never seen smiles like that. It's really something to be stopped on the street and to be told that, to see people so joyful about that, because it's their heart desire, you know? And that's that integration of that drive to autonomy with, well, with the family, with the father, with the mother, with the broader community. All that has to be in a higher order unit. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's that, the conservative insistence, right? It, exactly. Is that there, there are these, the wall, as you said before, the walls have to exist. You can have autonomy, but the autonomy has to exist within the walls. And then once you let the autonomy or the rationalism destroy all the walls, well, there's, there's no, no autonomy without the walls. There's right. just chaos.